Hello, welcome to NeoScribe. I've been excited about the idea of a Mars colony since I was in high school, but for the longest time my conception of Mars was limited. I knew about some of the well-known features along with the rovers and landers that were somewhere on the surface, and as I took time to study the planet more in depth, my excitement grew to fascination. So today we're going to start making sense of Mars, or at least build a foundation to build on. First, let's get a sense of scale of the features that we're looking at. This is how the United States would fit on Mars. Let your brain register this image for a moment. Since Mars doesn't have oceans or vegetation, this is actually a poor map to study the planet. My favorite way to study Mars is with this elevation map because it highlights all of the planet's amazing features. All right, now let's get familiar with the elevation scale. The areas in yellow are zero elevation, which was established by atmospheric pressure measurements that we won't go into. Because the important thing is that if you look at this elevation map in a certain way, the map presents it in a way that is familiar to us, and that is seeing bodies of water. What's more, it helps illustrate what the planet might have looked like long ago when it did contain water. Now let's imagine Mars having enough water to fill to the zero elevation point as it might have a long time ago. Mars would have a vast ocean in the northern hemisphere, with a massive lake in the southern hemisphere. And this is the broadest way to characterize Mars, by its two main regions called the northern lowlands and the southern highlands. Continuing our thought experiment, the areas in green would be relatively shallow between 1 and 3,000 meters deep, similar to the continental shelves here on Earth. And these green areas are collectively called the transition zone that separates the Martian highlands from the lowlands. In addition to elevation, the transition zone is where you start to see more distinct features such as mesas, knobs, and plateaus compared to the relatively flat lowlands. And then the southern highlands have even more diverse topography compared to the lowlands with this densely cratered surface along with the Thaumasia Plateau and the Tharsis Montes. Scientists believe that the surface of the southern highlands is much older than the surface of the northern lowlands because of the disparity in crater density. This assumption is based on what scientists discovered by studying the craters on the moon, that at some point around 3.8 to 3.5 billion years ago, the rate of asteroid impacts dropped dramatically in the solar system. So from here, you can break down the planet's regions further in different ways. The most common way is to reference the planet's major regions. We're going to cover these regions in great detail next episode, but today we're going to focus on the Mars quadrangles called the Mars charts, or simply MC. The charts were established by the US Geological Survey and split Mars into 30 regions. Now these Mars charts were established for the purpose of making maps, but I think it's the perfect way to start learning about the planet because it's organized and it's precisely defined. The numbering of the charts begins at MC1 at the North Pole and works its way south and then from west to east, ending with MC30 at the South Pole. And this helps your brain establish a firm conception of the layout of the planet. You see, if we're talking about a chart between 1 and 15, you instantly know that it's in the Northern Hemisphere. Charts 1 through 7 actually lays out quite nicely, except for MC3, the charts on this row primarily represents the Northern Lowlands. Then charts 8 through 23 are the regions that sandwich the equator, dominated by the Tharsis region on MCs 9 and 17. Tharsis is a vast volcanic plateau containing the largest volcanoes in the solar system. The plateau can get up to 7 kilometers high, not counting the volcanoes themselves that are much, much taller. Just take a look at Mount Rainier viewed from Seattle. Now this is what the plateau would look like from the same vantage point. Let's bring back the United States again. You can fit the whole country on it. It's insane. Finally, charts 23 to 29 make up the mid-belt of the southern highlands dominated by the Hellas Basin between MCs 27 and 28. Hellas is the third largest impact crater in the solar system. It's over 7 kilometers deep and about 2300 kilometers wide. Going back to our thought experiment, if Hellas was filled with water, it would make the North American Great Lakes look like puddles. Okay, now there's one final layer that I want to add to wrap this up, and that's making sense of where the space probes are located. We won't cover them all, but here are some of the more famous landers and rovers, starting with the Soviet Union's Mars 2 lander. Mars 2 crashed on Mars in 1971, becoming the first man-made object to impact the planet's surface. The exact site is unknown, but it's believed to have crashed on the western edge of the Hellas Basin in MC-27. Then there's NASA's Viking 1, which was a second spacecraft to soft land on Mars, landing on the west side of the Crashy Planitia, on the edge of the transition zone on MC-10. 
The Great Pathfinder lander is located on the Ares Vallis at MC-11, landing there in 1997. Then Spirit and the Legendary Opportunity are located on charts 23 and 19, landing on their respective sites in 2004. And Spirit shares MC-23 with the incredible Curiosity rover which landed in 2012. And the most recent probe to land on Mars is not too far away on the southwest corner of MC-15 with the InSight lander which landed in 2018. And if everything goes according to plan, the Perseverance rover will land on MC-13 on the Jezero crater on the western edge of the Icides Basin in February 2021. And with that, I hope you now have a more robust conception of Mars than you did before. And I hope you build off this and continue to make sense of our fantastic planetary neighbor. All right, thank you so much for watching. When humans finally land on Mars, I want to know as much about the planet as I possibly can. And that is the purpose of the Mars Academy series. And I hope that you continue this journey with me. I'm so excited to build off what we covered today. For episode two, we're going to explore Mars's significant regions in finer detail. And next week's video will be episode two of the Automation Age, and I hope you check that out as well. All right, that's all I have for now. I hope you enjoyed your journey. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe. I am Neil Scribe, and I'll see you on the next journey.